Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a new iPhone is out along with an updated iPad and revamped Apple TV. We'll have the latest. Also tonight, a closer look at how state trust land funds education and we'll hear how the arts can help heal neglected and abused children. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Apple today announced a number of new products, including a new iPhone and iPad, along with a revamped Apple TV. Joining us now is Buster Hine. He's the news editor of the Cult of Mac website. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Oh yeah, thanks, Ted. Good to have you. Okay, what exactly did Apple introduce today? Oh, so many stuff. It was their biggest announcement of the year. They had a iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, which we were expecting. They had the Apple TV, a new Apple TV, a giant iPad Pro. They also announced some uh, new Apple watches as well, the like gold and uh, rose gold option for that, that are cheaper and the sport models. Let's start with the iPhone because that really is how Apple makes its bread and butter here. 6S and 6S Plus. Right. Um, why are they better than previous numbers? The new thing Apple's introducing is 3D Touch, which uh, kind of allows new types of inputs. It allows you to, or allows the display to sense how much pressure you're putting on it. So you can peek inside apps or pop over to apps. It's kind of like adding shortcuts within the UI, and giving just users a new dimension to interact with it. Bigger, slimmer, smaller? The same size pretty much as the 6. Uh, they're faster. Uh, the display is the exact same. Better processor, better camera, more RAM. So they're, you know, it's newer, better in pretty much every way. A difference between the 6S and 6S Plus. There's no hardware differences, just the size of the screen, the 5.5 inch for the 6S Plus, and then 4.7 inch screen on the smaller 6. Okay, um, is, is it the kind of thing where you recommend someone with a 5 or the 5C, the 5 cheap as I like to call it, uh, <laughs> go up to the 6? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think this is, I mean, it's the best a upgrade Apple's ever released. If your smartphone is probably your main camera like mine, I think it's worth it just for that alone. They upgraded from, an 8 megapixel sensor to a 12 megapixel sensor. So way more definition, way more pixels. Uh, so your photos will look better. It'll be a lot better, easier to use with the new OS as well. Now I know the new iPad Pro is out today as well, as we mentioned. Um, it seems like the iPad has been somewhat stagnant. Uh, is that true? Is that correct? Yeah, no, uh, Apple's experienced slumping iPhone sale or iPad sales year over year for the, I think the last two years iPad Pro is really their effort to kind of reignite it and get it more into like the business space enterprise users and hoping that that'll really take off plus like some other partnerships they've made with IBM that's their big play this year. Now we're seeing we're seeing the original iPad then the iPad Air uh -huh. and then the iPad and the newest one's a big one in the back huh? Yeah gigantic. <laughs> that was like 12 inches there? Yeah 12.9 it's almost as big as your MacBook screen it's got more pixels on it than the Retina MacBook Pro which is a super high-end notebook. So, what would why, what's the difference then between like an uh, Air iPad Air uh, or just an iMac Air? Yeah. Uh, and this this 12-inch iPad. Look at this thing. This thing is monstrous. The, the main thing is for work. App, in iOS 9, which comes out later this month, Apple has a bunch of software that makes it so you can look at two apps at once on that huge display. They also have a new Apple Pencil that like is pressure sensitive and allows you to do a lot of new things with the giant tablet. There's also a uh, smart cover keyboard so you can type on it more like a laptop. So it's kind of supposed to bridge the gap between the MacBook and the iPad Air. So that keyboard, is that, that's, that's the same as a cover, correct? Is that, right, yeah. What, what's the other? What, this? The Surface, Microsoft Surface, yes. they introduced something similar about three years ago. It's very similar to Microsoft. So, so you don't have to do the tapping on the screen necessarily. Right. You can actually have the keyboard there and, and, and touch and go. Yeah. Okay. Um, now let's get to Apple TV because uh -huh. this is the, this is what I think confuses most people. Certainly does me. But it sounds so promising and could be the future of Apple. Yeah. It's Apple's first really serious play to like get into your living room. They've had the Apple TV for a number of years, but they've always called it a hobby. With the Apple, the new Apple TV. It's basically like turning your giant big screen into an extension of your iPhone. It now, the Apple TV will run iOS and all the apps on your iPhone as well. And developers, they can start programming games just for the Apple TV. You can watch content from Netflix, Hulu, HBO, a number of other sources. And there's also a Siri on it now. So instead of 
having to thumb through everything. You just pick up the remote, talk to her, and if she gets what you're saying, she will bring up the Stephen Colbert show or whatever you want to watch. So when I ask for Arizona Horizon, if that's, this Siri works like the Siri I have now, I'll probably get a <laughs> shot of a Horizon somewhere <laughs> over the Pacific. Right, yeah. The, supposedly there's been a lot of updates. We haven't got to play with it yet, but they say that they've fine-tuned her. <laughs> so but, but, but Apple TV sounds like, and we, I mean, they're going to probably start with original content, don't you think? That, that's a rumor is that Apple's looking into creating its own original content. They made a bid for Top Gear, which is a really popular BBC show. They've tried to buy a couple of other media properties. So with Apple TV, that's the thinking is that th this is going to be like their really big push to like kind of take on Netflix even and HBO possibly. Which means, and I've heard rumors, that they could even be building their own studio for original content. I mean, they could be a yeah. Huge. I, their aspirations are huge. They just launched Apple Music, which has tons of exclusive music deals. So you would think that a video type of service as well would make a lot of sense too. You mentioned the iPad, or I'm sorry, the iWatch, which, uh, first of all, is that thing selling the way they thought it would sell? I think it's doing really well. I think uh, there's some reports that it's not selling well, but Apple hasn't released any numbers. They say it's doing better than expectations, but they did announce two new models. Uh, today, mostly I think that appeal more towards female users. They have a, a gold version that's $399 now and a rose gold option that's $399 as well. The only option, way to get those earlier was to pay $10,000, $17,000 for those colors. So I think they're making it more a piece of jewelry for everybody. So we've, we've seen a lot of product here, a lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of changes. Does this count as Apple's next big thing, what they released today? Because everyone expects the next big thing, uh, but no, I mean, the sales that you had years ago, you can't duplicate those kinds of sales, can you? I think, yeah, I think with the iPhone 6S, Apple will break all of its sales records, um, mostly because of Android switchers. China is doing really well. It's their number, their second biggest market. Um, so with everything, they all didn't even get 80% of users didn't upgrade last year to the iPhone 6. So you have a lot of people who are just waiting for a new device. You mentioned China. Apple, I think, is number one in the U.S. iPhone market, but not in the world market. Why right. is that? I think it's Android. Android makes cheaper devices. They are you know, easier to get for a lot of people for low-income homes. So Apple's number one in the U.S. where you have you know, a bigger middle class. Uh, Tim Cook, Apple CEO, always talks about China's growing middle class as like a huge advantage. Uh, but Android, it still, you know, makes $100 phones, $200 phones, whereas the new iPhones are $600, $700. So I think that's the big advantage that Android has. And real quickly, before you go, you kind of uh, inferred this uh, earlier. Apple really is trying to get into the corporate market, aren't they? Yeah. No, it's the iPad Pro is their big play. They've been doing great with MacBook sales in the corporate market and enterprise, but the tablets haven't really taken off as well as they want to. So they're hoping the keyboard, the Apple Pencil, the bigger display, the new software, they think that's going to be the magic. But there's still laptops that are a lot cheaper than the new iPad Pro, which is pretty expensive. How much is that iPad Pro? Uh, $7.99 it starts at. That's so. an expensive lap, uh, expensive a tablet there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, nice little TV watching toy. Yeah, right? it sure <laughs> is. Hey, thank you for stopping by. We do appreciate it. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today.
Arizona received over 9 million acres of land from the federal government upon statehood back in 1912. The land is held in trust with over 8 million acres designated to benefit K-12 through education. But there are now plans to get more money to education by dipping further into trust land revenue. Here to talk about the importance of the land trust to children and education is Dana Wolf Neymar. She's president and CEO of the Children's Action Alliance. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you did a recent report now on state land trust funds for school. Right. Why? We're going to be doing a series of reports about education funding because, as you know, education funding is front and center for our legislature, for parents, for teachers, for voters around the state. Do people understand how these trust land funds work? It's incredibly complex. It took me a long time to understand it. There's really two parts of the land trust. One is managed by our state land department, and it's about leases on the land. But the other one that's really on the table right now for discussion is called the Permanent Land Trust. And the leases, that's the expendable revenue, correct? Right. And the permanent revenue is what the, the governor and others, lawmakers, are saying, uh, we could, we're taking a certain percentage out now, let's take a bigger percentage. That's right. So that's funds that come from sales of state land. And the funds are then managed by our state treasurer, invested by our state treasurer in trust. But some of those funds go out to schools and other beneficiaries each year. And that amount is really dictated by our Constitution, where there's a formula that dictates the annual amount. And the annual amount right now is 2.5%, correct? 2.5% of the average value of the trust over five years, correct. And the plan now is to increase that to 10%. For the that, first five years. That's the governor's proposal. 10% for five years, then 5% for five years, then back to the current constitutional provision. What are your thoughts on that idea? Well, we really view it as borrowing from our, our future. It's sort of like taking an early withdrawal from your 401k fund, your retirement fund, your college fund. You're trying to save that up for the future and you want it to be there. You have to have a really good reason to take an early withdrawal. So it's a loan from our future. And yet those who support the move say there is a really good reason that the schools need that money and they need the money now. School funding is absolutely insufficient today. What I worry about is what happens tomorrow. So if we do this early withdrawal, we have less money in the future from the land trust for schools. And what else is going to be happening for schools? The path that we're on now, we've had $400 million in tax cuts just since the Great Recession. That reduces funding for schools. We divert $100 million from public tax dollars to private schools. That reduces funding for public schools. We have a lot of formulas in state statute that we ignore, not just inflation, but other formulas as well. We're not doing repairs on our schools. So I really question if we do this early withdrawal, what happens 10 years down the road. And the JLBC, I believe, says that it would cost to the plan $3 billion over that 10-year period. And that, of course, is over the 10-year period. You look out, I think the, the treasurer's looked out over 50 years, 100 years, he's gone way out there. Right. And obviously that money would increase as far as a loss. The money increases over time, but if you take an early withdrawal, and especially if you dip into the corpus of the fund, so if you're taking out more than the earnings, which we could be under the governor's proposal, you have less money in the future. So are we hurting tomorrow's students for the sake of what may be a crisis today, which may make sense, but only if it's part of a bigger plan and we have something that we're building to for the future. Yeah, for those who say that the needs right now outweigh the future needs, you say? I say I'm worried about the future needs because we're, we're on this path of reducing state revenues. It's not clear to me that we're going to have sufficient funding in the future. We have a governor who um, has vowed that he will not support a tax increase for public schools. We have a dedicated sales tax that the voters passed in 2000 that expires in less than six years. When that expires, we lose $500 million that we're getting today. So I think this state land trust plan has to be part of a bigger proposal that really makes a commitment to sustainable funding. When you say a bigger proposal that makes a commitment, what kind of commitment, what kind of bigger proposal? I think we need a commitment to resolve the inflation lawsuit. We need a commitment to, for sustainable long-term funding. So what is that funding source going to look like in 10 years when the sales tax expires and when the land trust acceleration expires? For those who say, and they, they, they 
we have so many of these debates on Arizona Horizons. Mm -hmm. It's constant. Uh, they say that there is really, it, it's not so much that not enough money is being spent on schools, it's that it's being spent in the wrong place. Overloaded for districts and administration, not enough into the classrooms. We hear a lot of that, not enough into the classrooms. Yeah. Uh, valid? Well, we have the third lowest administration spending per student in the country. It is not valid to say we are wasting money on administration. We are very worried about money in the classroom, but the reason that's low is that overall funding is low. And what we need to recognize is that there's funding that is spent outside of the classroom that absolutely supports teachers and students. So things like school buses and school lunches are kind of obvious, the air conditioning, but things like reading coaches for teachers, things like professional development for teachers, things like extracurricular activities, things like school counselors and nurses. Those are not counted as classroom funding, but they make teachers' jobs work better and they help students. And yet, we hear all that, and this plan, this idea of dipping into the trust and maybe into the corpus as well here, uh, $1.8 billion over the first five years. Uh, I think it averages, what, $300 per student, something right. like that, right. added to what is already spent. Right. They're saying that's nothing to sneeze at. Well, it's certainly a big deal that Governor Ducey and our legislative leadership have stood up and said schools need more funding. I think that is very significant. And I love the sense of urgency that I'm hearing down at the Capitol now. I just think we need a bigger plan. And by bigger, um, we need to have more funding sources than just the state land trust. With that in mind though, and keeping in mind the nature of the legislature, the nature of the governor's office, the governor said he's not gonna raise taxes. And I don't see a lot of those lawmakers down at the Capitol getting all hot and bothered about raising taxes. If raising taxes is basically out of the question, it, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't be, but it's out of the question with these folks, mm -hmm. do you jump on board this because it's the best deal you can get? If it's part of something bigger. So our checking account, right, our state general fund revenues are growing right now. We have not heard a commitment from the governor or many legislators of how they will invest those dollars in education. We have our rainy day fund, our savings account. How will they invest those dollars in education? How will they support renewing or extending the current dedicated sales tax that the voters passed? That's not a tax increase, but if we lose that, we're, we're in bigger trouble than we are today. So uh, this, is, this is a nice fine point, but you want to see a, a, a more macro lo uh, look. Absolutely. All yes. right. It's good to have you here. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Appreciate it. Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at Free Arts for Abused Children of Arizona. It's a nonprofit group that helps heal abused and homeless children through artistic expression. Here with more is Alicia Sutton Campbell. She's executive director of Free Arts. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You bet. Give me a better definition of Free Arts for Abused Children. Absolutely. Free Arts is a nonprofit agency in town, and we heal abused and homeless children through artistic expression. And what kind of artistic expression? Any kind that you can think of. Of. We know that uh, art is a very accessible art form for children, but different art appeals to different children. So we want to make sure that when we're providing the tool of artistic expression to children, especially child uh, children who've been suffered some kind of trauma, that we then enable them to choose the art form that is most comfortable 
uh, for them or that they're the most interested in. So we're talking visual arts, mm -hmm. music, theater, yes, dance, they do theater. writing. We've done welding, we've done <laughs> cooking, <laughs> beading, sculpture, anything, hip hop dance, very popular. So yes, anything that the kids can think of, we want to provide it Have for them. Have any of these creative modes become more popular over the years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, the kids used to want to get into painting, now they want to get into dance. We used to want to get into theater, now they yeah. want to get into writing or something. Absolutely. There's certainly some classic art forms. Kids still love to write poetry. It's very expressive for them. Um, it's a very classical art form, but we've certainly seen the more urban or hip hop culture, arts culture emerging. In fact, uh, with about four years ago, we added to our camp series a hip hop culture camp where the kids do, they do hip hop dance, they do a street art, they do a DJing and an MCing, and a, rather than just writing poetry, they do a spoken word poetry. There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and w do you deal with group homes, treatment centers, how yep. does that work? Do the kids come to you? Do you go to the, the these these facilities? Both of those things. So two of our main programs, our mentoring program um, and our professional artist series program, we go to where the kids are. It's difficult for the kids to get to us and so we want to make sure that they can have these services. So we work with organizations um, that you, most people have heard of like UMOM or the Salvation Army, where these kids are living and we go to them with our mentors, with our artists and deliver the programs there. And then there's two programs where the kids come to us. We have a camp program and a fun program called Free Arts Days where the kids get to go and explore arts and culture venues around the valley like the Phoenix Art Museum. Uh, special considerations mm -hmm. when dealing with these particular children. Yes. What do you have to deal with here? So we work with our volunteers because the majority of our programming is delivered by volunteers. These are just normal people in the community. They're not artists. They just care about these kids and they want the kids to understand that there are adults in the community that care about them and want them to be successful. But for a, just an average person who maybe doesn't have experience with ch child trauma victims, um, we work extensively with our volunteers to make sure that they get training in um, you know, what happens to children when they've gone through trauma situations and then working with children in a group situation so that they can really feel comfortable when they go in with their art projects and delivering their programs. And a recent grant, uh, how much, 25000 It's 250000 250000 Holy mm -hmm. smokes, where's that money going to go to? That money is going to do a lot. So that is a gift that was given to us by the Bob and Renee Parsons Foundation. And we are very fortunate in Phoenix to have Bob and Renee Parsons here with us. Of course, Bob Parsons, the founder of GoDaddy. And the Parsons Foundation has been funding us for several years. This uh, fund about half of it will go to support our programs, specifically our professional artist series and our camp program. And then the other half of it is a matching gift. So we qualify for a very unique tax credit, the Arizona Foster Care Tax Credit. And not a lot of people know about it because it's relatively new. And what they, the Parsons wants us to be able to promote that for the community to understand that it's available for them to take. And they will match dollar for dollar any new donations that are made to Free Arts um, in conjunction with the Arizona Foster Foster care tax credit up to $100,000. And again, free arts, you're dealing with art as, as a healing process. Talk about unlocking the imagination, uh, self-esteem, uh, mm -hmm. social skills, all yep. of these things. How do the arts help with especially abused mm -hmm. children uh, get through those things and mm -hmm. to learn those things and get on with life. Absolutely, that's the main key right there is that we want these kids to understand that they don't have, their past don't have to define their future, that there are outlets for them and that they can really kind of move past the trauma that they've experienced and become kind of healthy adults in our community. Um, so the arts, if, if you can imagine a young child who is in maybe a homeless shelter situation with a parent, they don't often have the vocabulary or the words to be able to talk about what's happening to them and, and why they're not living in their home anymore. And maybe the parents are also, you know, they're really struggling and there's a lot of stress in the parent situation in those cases. So we're really, if you give a child, a young child in particular, art and tools, they, they have that ability to express what's happening in their emotions without using words. Do you push along those lines? I mean, if a child has been in a homeless shelter for quite a while mm -hmm. and they want to write poetry, mm -hmm. do you suggest they write about 
things that bother them or do you just let them free and find out what they're going to do? Yeah, there's a really good kind of nice balance that we want to strike with the kids where we can show them that they can use those tools, especially when they are frustrated or really having a hard day. We had a young man in a foster care group home situation who he would appear in front of the judge and he wasn't when talking about, you know, reuniting with his family and he wasn't really able to tell the judge what he wanted. Um, but he worked with one of our mentors and one of our artists and they did comic book drawing. My goodness. And he started drawing out his how he felt that day and how he was feeling about the future. And he actually took those drawings to the courthouse with him and showed them to oh the my. judge, which was really helpful for well, him. This sounds like a great program. You're doing great work. Continued success. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. We, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Arizona Artbeat is made possible in part by the Flynn Foundation, supporting the advancement of arts and culture in Arizona.